Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Tune Up Your Grant Application, which brings the Music Video Production Project to 2022 Members Lounge. My name is Neil Haverty, and I'm the Senior Manager of the Prison Prize and the MVP Project at the Canadian Academy. Members Lounge 2022 is presented by the Canadian Media Producers Association, which represents hundreds of Canada's independent producers. They're the people who make the shows and movies you love. Members Lounge 2022 is also made possible with the support of our programming partners, Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario, William F. White International, Bell Fund, La Femme Bell, Boat Rocker, Nabet 700M Unifor, Telefilm Canada, La Banque Nationale, Le Bureau de Cinema de la, et de la Television de Quebec, the Independent Production Fund, Panavision, and La Sodec. If you have any questions for today's speakers, please put them in the Q&A and we'll save some time for that at the end of the session. Um, we're here today to discuss the music video, uh, music video production in general, uh, because the MVP project portal is currently open and accepting submissions for consideration in round eight at mvpproject.ca. Um, if you're unaware, MVP project offers uh, music video production grants between five and fifteen thousand uh, dollars. So far, we've supported 75 music video productions to date. Today's guests represent four distinct roles from two of those productions, uh, and our goal today is to explore as much of that range of work as possible. Um, so I'm really excited to be joined uh, by our panelists. Um, I'd like to start by introducing Alan Sabir, who received MVP funding as a director of John Vinyl's Always. Um, a Kazakh Canadian filmmaker based in Toronto, Alam's practice includes short form narrative, documentary, music video, and high end commercial work with a perceptive style that explores the intricacies of human nature and his connection to the world at large. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Next, we have Bled Chaliuka. I knew I was going to get it wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, over his 10 years at Arts and Crafts as an artist manager, Bled has built and launched projects of all kinds, including international tours, album rollouts, and single campaigns, and of course, music videos. Bled manages songwriters like Jason Collette and Dan Mangan, as well as Katie Tupper, who also joins us today. Katie Tupper is a neo soul musician from Saskatoon. Her latest EP, Towards the End, is an incredibly strong debut that showcases her skills as a musician, writer, and producer. Uh, that EP features a song called Danny, which received MVP project funding in round six for a clip directed by Mashi Alam that dropped earlier this year. Welcome, Katie. Welcome, Bled. And our last panel uh, panelist for today is uh, Xavier Tu, who is a choreographer, producer, and movement director. Whether producing for film, choreographing music videos, or working as a performer, Xavier always bring, uh, seeks to bring innovation, creativity, and a multidisciplinary approach to his work. Xavier and Alum have worked together regularly, including on the video for Always by John Vinyl. So welcome all, thanks for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to talking about your videos. Um, I'd like to start by saying that at, at MVP Project, we look at music video as a, a team sport. Um, you know, the shoots are often on very short timelines and with a lot of input and energy from a lot of different people. Um, you know, there are, countless numbers of, of people that contribute to any project um, you know so today we have a sort of each, each of our panelists is here to speak on that their position from a different role their, a different perspective from that process um, you know we're going to cover um, we're going to cover the grant applications I know that that's in the sort of byline of this session is, is about tuning up your own grant application uh, I want to just mention off the top that um, you know we're here to answer your questions um, during this session but also afterwards um, you know the the portal is open and accepting submissions for uh, until the end of the month and um, myself or my colleague Rodas uh, would be happy to talk through any element uh, if you're a recording artist or filmmaker that's considering going for this grant um, you know, we, we are available to, to talk through the program guidelines. Um, they're very dense. I think grants are, um, you know, a good exercise in getting your artistic vision down on, on paper, but, um, you know, it sometimes can feel sort of disembodied from, from the actual music video creation. So, so, you know, if you need, uh, tips or, or help with that, then, then please reach out. So, so I just, you know, wanted to put that up front because I feel like, 
we can get into the minutia of grant applications, but I think that what we what's most interesting is sort of your experience on music video sets and and how uh, how these projects went for you. So I think to start, I, I'd like to start uh, by asking Katie about uh, your experience. You're obviously the one that we see and hear in the Danny video. You're the you know the recording artist. It's your song. It, um, and uh, but but you've worked with Mashi Alam a few times in the past. Um, and so I just sort of wanted to ask you about what your role was in the initial application stage and then, um, you know, within within your perspective uh, on shooting the video, um, which, you know, you're you're in a unique position in that you're you were on camera for it. So uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that sort of starting point um, when you got together with the ideas and then how that felt when you were actually in front of the camera. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So I guess I finished the song um, and it definitely, um, there was a, a you know, discussion on which songs are coming out first. And with that, you choose which ones you want music videos with. So Danny became one of them that we selected. Um, and at the time I was living near Banff in the mountains. And so the second I got the song back, I knew like I wanted this large like mountainscape sort of dreamy situation um and these visuals come to me very quickly and very easily and having already worked with mashi on two before i knew just based on her her ambition and hard work like it would be very easy um to create that sort of video that i wanted um and then with that knowing what an ambitious video it was um bled presented the idea of applying to mvp which I'm very glad he did. Um, I think we would have tried to get the music video done however we could, but um, being able to collaborate on applying for that grant and then getting that grant and being able to dream even bigger with how I could, how this music video could be was really exciting. Um, and then I flew out to Toronto and we shot everything. Um, Mash and I interacted a lot on like the treatment and visuals, um, but I'm fairly new to music videos. So sort of as soon as I got there, I was just on screen. I gave up control completely to her and she sort of made the rest of the magic happen. That, and, it, and it turned out very beautifully. I think that's a really great summation of sort of when you finish a song to when it uh, gets on screen like that. I mean, this is a, it's a, a beautiful video. And um, I, I wanna just talk a little bit about um, the application process before we move on. Bled, I think it sounds like you sort of put this on the radar uh, for Katie and the team. Um, I guess I would like to sort of know as, as an artist manager and label, um, you know what you what you do to prepare for something like this um and 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 get ready to sort of apply or or, or to institute a marketing idea for example um i i just sort of want to talk about the pre-production process and 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 what goes into your planning yeah yeah for sure the a lot of for music videos a lot of the pre-planning is really making sure the idea is sound really and making sure in our example that katie and mashi agreed on the, the treatment and the, the full idea of the video. And I know Katie came up with it, but it really, we had to have buy-in from everyone. And that's mm -hmm. like on the outset. And then, and then you go into, does this make sense for our, and I think in the grant process, it's like, does what our idea, like that we're kind of coming together with, does it make sense for a grant? Mm -hmm. And that's where, um, we can get into that a bit later in terms of grant conversations too, because sometimes grants don't make sense for the idea that you have or the thing you want to be doing. Um, and that's fine. But I think pivoting your idea to fit the guidelines of a grant is where people run into maybe some problems. Um, so in this case though, it was, it was quite seamless because Katie and Mashi had worked together on two other videos. And like Katie mentioned, once we kind of, applied for the grant, we could just make everything just a little bit bigger and better effectively. And uh, Katie, did you find that working with Mashi again uh, sort of provided a little bit of a shorthand, like you, you had a relationship where things were easier uh, by the time you got to working on Danny? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, maybe with a new director you don't know yet, you don't know like how to interact, but by the time we got to Danny, I was like sending her Pinterest 
visuals at 1 a.m texting her like you know you get a lot more casual and it's easy instead of having to sit down and have meetings and sort of make all your thoughts concise for short moments we definitely had like more of a personal working relationship where um sort of the weeks and months leading up to shooting the video there was a constant stream of communication which i think just the type of video that it was and all the different working parts um was really helpful for me at least to understand what I was getting myself into a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, repeat collaborations in my experience seems to uh, yield sort of more impactful results. Um, on that note, I wanted to uh, speak to Alan and Xavier a little bit about their working relationship. And, um, you know, you applied together for Always and, and saw that through as a team. But uh, I think specifically, I'd, I'd like to sort of get into what the sort of differences between a director's work and a producer's work it, are uh, and um you know sort of what your roles were like on the on not only in the um application process but but also on set so so maybe let's start with xavier um what what was your role like on the always shoot and 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 through the application process yeah so um for the process alan and i wrote the treatment together and then we functioned as co-producers and I was also the choreographer on it. Um, and there was a big movement component to it. So um, we made sure that it was integrated when we wrote it together. And uh, Alan is of course the director. And what kind of things uh, is a producer, like, you know, I, like, imagine that there's somebody here that doesn't know the definition of, of the word producer, like what kind of tasks are you tasked with on, uh, uh, let's talk specifically about production time and what's happening and what you have to take care of. Yeah, I think uh, the producers just make it happen uh, top to bottom. They bring all the logistics together. They tie in all of the things like insurance, locations, uh, helping uh, to organize the crew, um, just seeing the project through from end to end. So that's everything ranging from finances to logistics to everything, pretty much anything that happens. Um, and then also trying to make that budget stretch as far as possible. Yeah, and then in a way, you also sort of are tasked with clearing the way for Alan to, to direct and to, to sort of um, stay focused on the creative aspects. So Alan, can you tell me a little bit about your role as director? Um, and maybe maybe we can talk a little bit about how it differs on a music video set to, uh, you know, the other work in film or commercial mm -hmm. production. Uh, but, but, but generally, I think, like, let's talk about what the director does uh, on a music video set. For sure, for sure. I think, like, for us, for me and Xavier, we're having like such a interesting dynamic being both creative people but also both having to deal with the producing mindset of things it's definitely like an experience of separating ourselves from like in the creative mode and then putting on the producer hat and really going to the grinder and and, and just like seeing what's feasible what's possible what's not possible so i think as a director having to also produce it's it's definitely coming up with like the creative world in the writing process which also happens with Xavier and then really once you have the the plan your creative plan and then your producing plan which is the execution of your ideas when, when it comes down to set and just overall project management as a director I think I'm there really to just see it through make sure that what we're planning what's our what's what we all talk about from the start of the project and the ideation process is reflected in the delivery. And sometimes that means managing crew, managing the creative part, making sure just elements and things come together in a way that reflects the, the treatment ultimately. And like Xavier was saying, it really is about stretching that budget and as a director to be mindful, not just of the creative and just like, make the vision happen you know <laughs> anything for the shot like it's it's not really like that it's really about collaboration and working together and being open and you know a good idea a good idea i always like to think is can be uh can be described and portrayed in the simplest way right so like if the idea isn't good enough and it requires too many things for a budget that cannot accommodate it maybe it's a time to to just find a better idea <laughs> right yeah. ultimately that that fits and that works and um it helps us uh, our team because 
Xavier can produce um, and do choreo and be kind of like a production manager, just do a lot of logistics in, a, in addition to creation. And on my side as well, like I usually direct for, for the always video. I ended up like uh, editing it and coloring it. So budget can go way further and we can just have more elements. So I think the more versatile you are as a director, because ultimately it's your job to put this piece out in the world, the, the more options you have on hand when creating. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you brought up a lot of interesting points there. I, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the treatment and and sort of the the idea of your application. So so basically, just long story short, uh, there are a few application materials that are sort of required for for basically any grant application. But in this case, um, you know, we we really sort of focus on uh, the uh, what's called a treatment, uh, and essentially, it's sort of a, a four or five page document that outlines um, the the core ideas of what you plan to shoot. Um, the th I want to show you a couple of the treatments uh, for Danny and always. Um, I'm going to just sort of go through, but I, I think that I, uh, people struggle with the idea of this because they think, well, I haven't shot anything. And it's like, well, no, actually what you're supposed to do is sort of go and pull um, imagery and, and um, inspiring um, things that you find on the internet that sort of speak to the aesthetic of what you're going to do ultimately in your in your production. So I think that people look at sort of the list of, of what's required for the treatment and get a little worried about it or, or segment it. But it, the idea is essentially you're supposed to make a, a document that, that where your ideas can jump off the page. A juror goes through 50 or 60 uh, applications. You know, there's some fatigue by the end. You want to be able to open that that treatment up look at it go i get what they're trying to do um and and uh, go forward from there so like you know i think it's interesting uh because we don't sort of give it a direct example treatment um they come in in all different sh shapes and sizes and 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 you know like uh it's interesting and in, even in this case where danny and always sort of have two different sort of treatment styles i think that uh, i want to just show you uh you know danny had um very clear visual examples uh, on the left side here um, and and you know it's a, a pretty quick tight four or five pages um, and and it, it, it's you know by looking at that side panel there you immediately know sort of what the goal of the video is and I, I'd say that the video actually ended up pretty pretty close to this um, and that's something that that doesn't always happen but um, you can understand why that you know like six months earlier when you're pulling images uh, is going to be a little different than when you're when you're sitting there uh, on production day um, you know in the case of the always treatment I think you guys took a uh, slightly different tact in that you know it's it has the director statement, it has synopsis, but it, it you know, goes through sort of scene by scene what the intention of the video is going to be, uh, which, you know, in the case of always, there's a lot of setups in the video. There's a lot of sort of um, moving through the world of, of Toronto. I think it's a really great Toronto video. Um, uh, but, you know, so in this case, outlining that in the treatment was effective because, uh, you know, you got to sort of sense what the narrative of, of the video was going to be. And, and for the most part, I feel like this is what, what uh, comes across in, in the video. Um, but as you can see, the treatments are just supposed to be sort of splashy. And, and uh, you know, we do ask for some sort of technical elements. We do ask for um, you to explain your sort of vision. But but ultimately, it is really about sort of the images, the aesthetics that, you know, you want the juror to, to envision what the video is going to be. Um, just immediately. So, so, you know, I just wanted to show you guys that I, I encourage you all to take a look at the videos. We won't show them now. Um, but I uh, sort of want to talk a little bit more about that when, when, you know, you're putting together your treatment. Um, I'd like to maybe start with Katie, uh, because Katie and Mashi and Bled were sort of in that initial stage. What, what went into your image search and your and your um what was it that you were looking for when you were seeking out inspiration um yeah so definitely specifically for the music video sort of as i was talking on a bit earlier i was living in the mountains and like just overwhelmed with um that sort of new landscape that i wasn't used to so i knew i wanted to incorporate that um and having worked with mashi on two other videos and just knowing her style as well um, she does a really good job of capturing like a lot of beauty in a really quirky way, almost like she has a lot of subtleties in her work and lots of small bits of humor. So 
I think like Wes Anderson, I know that's a very <laughs> um, used example, but that was definitely like an inspiration, lots of color and pastels and funny quirks. And I think Mashi does it, it in her own way. And so that was definitely an inspiration. Um, I knew that I wanted to bring like femininity into rock climbing because that was a big part of my life at the time. So I think all the influences, obviously I had a story in mind, but now reflecting back, they're influenced a lot just by what I was wanting and feeling at the moment. Um, and then, yeah, trying to get that to come across visually. I think quirky is the right word for it. I mean, there is a relationship that develops with a mannequin in this video. So I think that uh, it definitely uh, goes that way. And I, I per, for one, don't think Wes Anderson's a dirty word. I think uh, it's it's a great <laughs> thing to, to sort of use as an inspiration. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, Alan, I want to talk to you a little bit about your treatment um, and, and maybe um, you can speak specifically to the always treatment and, and what you were thinking when when you guys were putting that together but also I just sort of want to know generally uh what you think sort of the where where should somebody put their energy when they're putting together a treatment like this mm -hmm. yeah for sure um I think with our treatment we were definitely very uh well for us any treatment is driven by the song of like and, and I think it has to uh, that's the source of kind of our energy when it comes to it and also like I find oftentimes when writing treatments uh, as directors and our, uh, or people who are pitching at the very least, you're often caught up in responding to a prompt or to a brief. And I find there's always this like, um, I guess you can be find yourself a bit torn where you wanna portray your vision, like your cinematic film vision, but also ultimately it's about the artist. It's for the artist, right? So it's important to recognize the, the difference between the two. Um, but I think what we're, the way we make it work for us is having like a, a philosophy of our work and our core, which is then through that, through that is ingested into the response to the prompts and to the briefs. So when it comes to writing treatments, that's our starting point. And then further, uh, when we go just down the road, developing the treatments, we really have not a structure, but we, I, I guess, to make it the most useful, I could even break down the um, thought process behind the always treatment. Yeah, please. And uh, for us, we we uh, we start with um, question a lot of questions to each other. And the first one is, what kind of format is it going to be? So whether it's performance, narrative, a mix of both, or like what is the uh, language of showing this piece? Uh, and then we talk about like the big idea, which is like the journey or the story, and uh, that's establishes a bit of a playground and a sandbox for us to exist in. And then from there, we, we, we kind of go in and um, talk about individual beats and scenes and kind of just through that process, um, the treatment unfolds itself. And it's very much a process of discovery of where, where the story goes, as opposed to trying to reach a certain end goal. Uh, so, so that's kind of our approach on treatments and then what, what was the other question again sorry well I mean I, I, I guess that that actually answered it because I, I feel that um, you know it is really obvious when uh, a treatment has been shoehorned uh, into a song you know where the ideas don't really match up and you're like wait a second and you know in our case it's funny because you can sort of go back and maybe they've even applied with that with a different song in the past you know and, and, mm -hmm. and it's, so you can you can feel that and that energy that you're talking about being put into sort of uh, every moment of the song and planning out what you're going to do I think that's super important to an impactful video uh, because it's it is part and parcel right the the, mm -hmm. the music and the video are working in uh, symbiosis right so so it, it's it's obvious and it and it immediately sort of hits you if it's if those things are off kilter mm -hmm. um, so so yeah I mean I, I think that you you spoke to sort of working on uh, working very hard to to keep that front of mind I think that's great yeah, thank you. And, and I think there's also like having the dynamic writing with Xavier, we, we often talk about there's almost like two mental lanes that we go in and maybe Xavier, you can speak on that a little bit more too, where when we write together, for me, I'm, I'm very much like in the, the story, the narrative, the character, the philosophy, and then Xavier um, is more on the commercial and um, uh, feasibility side of things. So maybe X, you can even touch on that. Yeah, um, Alam is a dreamer, 
by nature <laughs> has some beautifully large ideas and, and beautiful visual ideas. And I guess my role sometimes down the line is thinking about it a little bit more from a client delivery perspective and a pragmatic perspective. And sometimes there's an idea and I'm thinking about the logistics of, okay, but how are we going to make that happen? How much is that going to cost? What am I looking at in terms of liability for this to happen? And um, so sometimes it's, it's a funny dichotomy. We come to this idea together and then we take, we, we run at the same time. And then sometimes he's like, well, that's not, that's not ambitious enough sometimes. Or I'll be like, well, that's kind of impractical. We won't have enough time with this budget and the amount of days that we're going to be needing to shoot. Or am I thinking about a client? So, um, and he has all these crazy, beautiful, big ideas that ultimately make the video. So um, for us, it's, it's like a yin and yang of sorts uh, with our dynamic. Um, but we ultimately come to the same conclusion. So you've outlined like a perfect director producer relationship there, really. I mean, every dreamer needs somebody to be like, hey, feasibility, uh, let's talk that through a little bit. And and uh, it, the yin and yang that you're talking about, I think, uh, makes for a really solid team, because uh, if there's too many dreamers, then the other side isn't addressed. And and if the, if it's too practical, then, you know, some of the best ideas don't get to come to the, the fray. So I think that you guys are offsetting each other in a perfect sort of way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, grant uh, applications in general. I mean, obviously in Canada, it's a big part of the ecosystem on both the film side and on the recording artist side, um, you know, but there, it can sometimes as an artist or, or as a creative person feel like a drag to sort of get into the minutia of budgets and, and you know, line items and making sure you have every, every part sort of submitted properly. Um, Bled, I want to talk to you a little bit because I think that as a manager and as a, a label uh, representative, you, you take care of that. Uh, or at least um, sort of guide that process uh, for for artists. And I, I want to sort of talk about how, you know, one thing about MVP project, for example, is that we have 300 or 400 applications in every round, and we only have enough resources to fund about 12 videos. So by virtue of that, it's a very competitive process. There is uh, essentially, um, you know, the one variable when people don't get this grant that I can tell them uh, definitely contributed is that very fact that it's competitive. So I want to talk a little bit about how that roller coaster affects the way you plan uh, for your artists, um, because I know that uh, you know, I've been, I've prayed that a grant would come through, put everything on it, and then it doesn't, and then your whole plan has to change. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, when you're going through the process, obviously, you know, you want to keep a little bit of that dreamer element where you're like, you know, when when we get this grant, but you also have to be practical and 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 say, you know, what happens if we don't? So could you speak a little bit about that and, and sort of contingency planning, I guess? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it happens all the time. We, we don't get 100% of the grants we apply for, um, no matter what artist it is. So yeah, really, like I did mention very briefly earlier, it's that the, the plan, I think, I think all grants have to be kind of like a cherry on the top bonus kind of idea. And so the plan has to exist and you have to have kind of a, it can shift and mold and change as you go. But the plan has to be pretty solid that then you go, okay, which grants make sense for this plan? Whether it's recording an album, doing a music video, applying for tour funding, whatever it is, but it has to exist on its own quite uh, substantially in my mind. Because then if you don't get it, then you at least just reduce how much you're spending. So if it's a music video, maybe we don't make a $15,000 one, we make a $5,000 one and we can kind of be more, at least happier spending out of pocket something that we would normally be doing but mm -hmm. same with recording like recording an album is just getting more and more expensive and you know back in the day you'd hear of like i don't know to me it's sometimes like a ten thousand dollar rec or album and record is like becoming rarer and rarer it's mm -hmm. very difficult unless you're doing literally everything yourself so sometimes that's possible and sometimes an artist can do it but it all depends on who the resources or what resources you've got who's around what's the community and like alan said like if you can kind of take on a bunch of those roles yourself you can kind of stretch that budget further um, and then the grant hopefully comes in and then you can kind of just relax a little bit and then say okay now we've got 
we've got an extra 30k to work with for an album or mm -hmm. an extra 10 for the video things like that are really useful um and like i mentioned like the guidelines are all there so for there's sometimes like 30 pages or something like for some grants you know but they're all there because you got to think about the certain mandates right um we run into this a lot where there's provincial grants federal grants private grants you know so each each body that's awarding this this money has a certain mandate whether it's supporting canadian creatives or ontario creatives or alberta creatives whoever it is um so you got to think about like is my idea going to be good enough for those mandates and and if not then don't go to that grant body or go in expecting not to get it kind of thing so yeah yeah, I think that the, to jump off that, I mean, there's just so many variables you can't control when you're applying for a grant. I mean, even the jury process is a uh, confidential sort of group of, in our case, like 30 jurors every every round. Um, and, you know, it's sort of subjective in a way. It's a, it's a consolidation of their subjective opinions on your project. And there's just so many variables that go into that. So, so you can't plan for you know which jurors are going to see your application whether they're into your kind of music whether they you know they think that the, you know that, that those are just variables that you just can't even know about so so you know like to to be I, I just like always want to tell people that if you don't get the grant, um, those uncontrollable variables have a lot to do with it. Um, and then and then the other thing, I, I guess, Alam, I want to talk about it from from a director's standpoint, because I think a lot of the time you're expected to sort of put in work into a pitch. And sometimes, uh, you know, if, if you don't get the grant, then it just doesn't go forward. But I, I'm curious about uh, what that sort of grant roller coaster feels like from on your end, where, especially because you're starting to spark a new relationship with artists and and or or you know you're you're trying to sort of um, bring your two uh practices together um can you tell me a little bit about how how it feels on the director side to sort of put your your chip down on the table with a grant application yeah for sure i think as a, as a director uh specifically with grants is just another opportunity and an outlet to pitch for yourself so the way i see it and just in general, in terms of like a career progression for myself and growth in the industry is to have as many reaches in different direction uh, as possible. So whether it's towards brands or if, you know, a lot of people ask about where else there are um, possibilities to, to, to work as a music video director, for example. And I think people don't realize that there are people whose job is to give out music videos and they're called like video video commissioners. Uh, so people can often uh, message the commissioner directly or talk to the label or to the production company. So for me, it's very much have as many reaches as possible. And if the grant comes in, cool, that's the next project. And if not, then, you know, it is what it is. But ultimately, it's about always moving forward and never being mentally stuck in one place, right? Because I think, yeah, life just goes on. We make videos all the time and it's just finding those opportunities to keep applying and keep looking for, for, for the grants. Yeah, that, for that is, work. I think is so key. I mean, we, uh, in the bios uh, at the start of this, I, I, you're all multifaceted uh, professionals doing a bunch of different things. And I think that it's all about sort of planting seeds of opportunity uh, and mm -hmm. dropping as many of those seeds as possible and seeing totally. what grows. And because I mean, not everything grows. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so, you know, I, I think also bled sort of touched on something interesting to me which is that you know like the the budgets aren't getting smaller the the demands on the artists uh, and and the creatives are getting larger um so i think I, it's a little bit of a segue into i want to talk a little bit about how the music video landscape specifically has changed um and and i think we can start with with um with Katie, because I, I think that as an artist uh, in, in 2022, the expectations of, you know, making a record, you know, touring when when it's safe to do so, um, but also, you know, like being a presence online and, and social media has really changed the game. Uh, and uh, TikTok is driving a lot of that. I think a lot of what's happening in music uh, on a large scale is uh, TikTok has something to do with these days. Um, and I know that you're, you're um, getting involved in that you're doing a great job on TikTok and interacting with it and and i'm just curious about how that has changed your uh approach to 
supporting an EP or, or you know, so supporting your music, uh, how does it integrate into your life as a recording artist? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is, um, I think, can be considered a little bit overwhelming for artists these days, especially like um, up and coming artists or new developing artists, uh, because it's a very accessible and very easy way if it goes well, but there's no telling on how to do it well. There's no rule book. So you just have to kind of try different things out and figure it out. And I think at least for, in terms of an EP, um, I think social media and TikTok specifically, I look at it more as just, uh, you know, a second form of marketing. I kind of throw things in there, but in order to stay sane and healthy and happy, I just throw things out there and I don't look at it because I think, um, especially the way that TikTok is designed and the videos that do well on TikTok, are ones that use the language of the app that is changing every few hours, every few days. You have to be in on the app constantly to know which songs are blowing up, which different things are changing. And it relies a lot on spending a lot of time online, which obviously isn't good for anyone. Um, so I think, yeah, as like trying to use it for my music career, um, I'm now in a place where, um, I just do it as sort of a off the hand thing. And most of my videos that I put effort into, no one watches. And it's the ones that I'm running out the door to work and singing something that do well. So knowing that, and I think people really appreciate um, a candidness online, then that's just what you gotta do. Don't think too much about it. Just present yourself online, have it be a very small part of your world and then let your, focus on your music, focus on everything that's offline and use that as a small little part to promote it. Even though I know it's so huge and it can change people's lives, but I think um, like keeping your integrity of your music and just pushing forward in a way that you're comfortable and then using that sort of as a secondary, honestly, just a piece of marketing. You don't mm -hmm. put up a billboard and expect that to change your life. You put up a billboard for a casual group audience. And so I think you have to use your online presence as that as well and do it in a way that you're comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And it's another another place where you, there's so many variables you just can't control. So the, to try to control it, to try to spend all your time uh, narrowing in on yeah. what it is that's going to make a TikTok blow up. It's I mean, impossible. It, yeah. So so it strikes me that having that sort of, like there's yeah. Um, Xavier, maybe you can speak a bit, a little bit about it because obviously TikTok has been uh, huge for dance. Um, it, it's sort of platformed it in a way that it is like everyone I know has a dance TikTok now. Um, and so, so I'm curious about, uh, from a choreographer standpoint, um, how that's changed the way you approach your work. Yeah. Um, clients and artists more than ever are requesting short form deliverables, TikTok dances, I couldn't tell you how many times artists come to Alam and I and they say, hey, I, I really want this TikTok dance set up in the middle of the video. And that, of course, changes the entire uh, treatment writing process and the production process and the pre-pro process, because now we're thinking of fitting this thing that's supposed to be this viral TikTok dance into a body of work, which will, of course, change the, the flow of the edit, the narrative, um, making sure that the dance is shot in a certain way that's conducive to TikTok. Um, and yeah, it just changes the entire filmmaking process. But Alan and I really try to make sure that we're flexible in all of our ideas and all of our processes to be in line with any marketing and distribution goals that the client might have. And uh, with that flexibility comes completely different production processes that change by the moment. And I guess maybe Alan can talk about it as like a director too. Yeah, I think to add to that, like the way I see it is that I never approach my work or the things that I do with TikTok or any like platform in mind, to be honest. It's always centered around what I'm trying to say or what I'm trying to do with this project. However, though, like having the all these social medias and uh, outlets and these platforms, it I, uh, I find it, it helps to add on the deliverable aspect in the treatment. So then right away, it becomes like a tool of advantage when, when pitching on something. So now instead of 
one three minute video in the deliverables, we usually say like one video, one 60 second uh, post, cause that's like Instagram, one 15 second thing. Cause that's stories in TikTok and photos and stills BTS. So now like even from the treatment perspective, we are now pitching not just one video, but video and multiple assets within that, that mm -hmm. kind of might make it look more valuable. Like you, the client or the video commission is getting more out of it than what they initially asked for. So I think using that to our advantage. And then I think the, the reward is much higher than the, the amount of work it takes uh, in terms of us just cutting out a little 15 second piece in the edit takes like two seconds. But if it increases the chances of getting the the grant, then why not, you know, uh, in terms of like dance specifically too on camera, I think like Xavier said, making sure it looks good and clean so that people can see it and replicate it. <laughs> yeah. The the thought of trying to shoehorn a, a current TikTok dance into a, a production that's going to be on sort of a, even a, even a fast production schedule, it seems absurd to me only because the trend is over within two days, you know? So I think that the transient nature of the, of TikToks as, as Katie was talking about, where you sort of just interact with it quickly and you move on uh, it it's in a way sort of, it's a big challenge that you guys are facing. If people are asking you to put, put current trends in, because by the time you're done the edit and by the time the video drops, there's a new dance, right? hundred percent. Yeah. And I, I think to that point, it's also like something, to, uh, a conversation of art versus content, right? So it's setting those intentions and recognizing those intentions and moving with that, being mindful of that can really like smooth and help the approach and the process of the production in general. And, and I will add that there is a, an interesting little subsection of people happening where they are now treating TikTok as the art. And there's artists like The Count or, or, or people like that who are like, you know, essentially foregoing the idea of doing music uh, songs in full length at all anymore. And, and essentially their whole art form is going to TikTok and, and that short form content. And so that's interesting to see. Uh, but I think that... Uh, long form narrative work, um, you can feel the energy that was put into it, you can feel the time and energy that was put into it. Uh, Bled, maybe you can speak a little bit from from a labels perspective, a manager's perspective on, on, you know, having to make that call to the artist saying, I know I just asked you for some assets, but I need some more assets. Um, tell me a little bit about what that feels like. Yeah, really. It's and sometimes it's like, especially with like we're talking TikTok, but even social media in general, it's like so much of it is on the artist or the recording artist to to handle right now. And so creating assets like Katie's been doing on TikTok is largely a one person job right now. Um, and a lot of people, like some people, like at the high end, probably have some teams doing it for them and recording and editing for them. But a lot of the people that use it are really experienced with the apps and mm -hmm. so um creating that content is really just like katie said kind of a scattershot approach it was something might hit and it's additive but the content that we try to strive for is like what speaks to the songs and what speaks to the music and what speaks to the intent of the of the art you know so content for content's sake is like I don't know. She's not an influencer. It's like, it, it's like one of those, like, what's the difference between like an artist and an influencer. And so um, that's one of those things where, especially, I, I don't know, especially as an indie label, we have to kind of be really thoughtful about the artists themselves and like music first, mm -hmm. musicians first, rather than kind of getting the, <laughs> the, the most out of every content piece, basically. Yes, I mean, I feel like we all could talk about this uh, all afternoon because I think there is a great divide happening and it's really sort of intriguing to think about where it's going to go and how they mix in. I mean, I, I'm very fascinated by the idea of putting sort of TikTok dances into, into a larger production that just seems so scary to me. I can't believe you guys have to deal with that. Yeah, um, I mean, I did talk to, I wanted to, like a, a manager, another manager who said, I want to make a music video that's basically six different potential TikTok videos that all seamlessly get absorbed into one long music video that like have a sort of tie-in narrative. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see some of that more where it's like 
in theory, it's the same video, but they'll release it in chunks that it's like 20 seconds long or something. So right. those kinds of the form can kind of help change a little bit of the art, but you have to be careful with that, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I want to transition now into a Q&A. We have some questions coming in uh, from our attendees. Uh, you know, they are somewhat sometimes um, directly about the grant, so I'll, I'll answer them, but I'm, I'm curious about sort of your opinions about it. So I'm going to start with one, and I'll pose it to you guys first, even though it's sort of um, in, in wording about the grant. Um, but is it worth it to reapply with the same song and concept a second time if you strengthen your ap application? So I just want to sort of talk about the idea of um, whether ideas die in the water when you submit them or whether uh, like what what compels you to keep an idea in the running? Um, I, I'll answer it from the grant perspective in a second, but I, I'm curious if anyone wants to speak to, um, you know, when something has been rejected or, or, or um, you know, like passed on, what makes you stick around and think that it's a good idea? In terms of the video or the song? I, I guess, I guess it could be, it can be broad. I mean, it can be essentially like what, what, what would make you persevere uh, on an idea that you submitted that you think has legs? Too broad? I can maybe, maybe try to yeah. answer that. If uh, <clears throat> I think for us, like if an idea doesn't go necessarily, it's hard to, to be honest, it's hard to stick with it and like try to reapply because with time goes by and I feel like with, as a director and artist, you're always working with craft and yourself. So let's say if we have an idea and then three months later, like me and Xavier have a few treatments that never got selected and we just left them in the vault. <laughs> we never kind of go back and rehash because by the time we get to a point of reapplying, we look at our old treatment and we just go, oh man, it's just not it anymore, you know? And, and we just want to make something better. So I think it's kind of what I was saying before is if an idea doesn't pick up right away, uh, maybe just take a look at the idea again and like think of how can you simplify it? How can you make it more unique? And also being tapped in and what's happening around is like, uh, is it a common idea? Are, are there a lot of videos that are kind of like that, you know? And so, but at the same time, keeping an archive of all the treatments, because you never want to lose that because I do believe like at some point in the future, there might be a project that comes to you or to, and then you, you might be like, oh yeah, I have this treatment that perfectly fits that. And then you can just rework and develop the idea, but always update it. I don't think it's ever leaning back on the same core. It's, keeping it fresh because I think if we write treatments for the song specifically it has to apply to a new song so I think inherently it will have to change a little bit yeah so so from the grants perspective I mean it, there's no guideline that says you can't resubmit something but the nature of it is that by the time the jury sits by the time they deliberate by the time the song gets through the whole process that can be between three and six months uh, you know, the nature of the music industry is that it's moving so much faster than that. Uh, you know, if you're talking about applying with the same song in a second round, you're talking about at least a year's worth of time where, you know, from the first application and, and you know, music moves faster than that these days. And, and I think that um, certainly like you can reapply with, with uh, the same song, but I think it would be about, um, you know, looking at your application again and saying, well, what's going to make this feel right when it drops now instead of the summer, it's going to drop in the fall of, of, you know, the future, the next year. I, I sort of tell everybody that they should be looking sort of three to six months ahead of time um at least really like because you know you you want to leave time for production you want to leave uh that much runway i mean it, it is it has always been i think it is changing a little bit um as far as how much runway you leave before your single drops i mean if you're kanye west you can put it out as soon as it's before it's done uh but you know like i think that in this case where there's sort of a lot of planning a lot of moving parts uh the idea of submitting twice means you're submitting a single that you know, in some cases, we get people submitting something that has been out for a year. And it's like, you know, there is a possibility the music video could revive that song there, it can have a second life. But I think you should just always be looking forward with with anything you're doing. Um, and, and maybe a little further forward than you think you should. 
Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues to feed me another question, if possible. Okay, so here we go. So what is the resource you use uh, to find music videos to pitch for? Is a relationship with the labels, reps? I think we can talk, I, I missed this question in my um, sort of Q&A, but Alan, I think we can talk a little bit about uh, what it's like uh, to link up with recording artists and how that goes. I think I, I'd be interested in it from the recording artist side as well, but let's start on the filmmaker side. Um, you know, how, how do you search for these opportunities? How do you, how, how does that connection occur? Yeah, so that's a great question. I th and I think that's like one of those uh, mysteries that every, everyone is always wondering about. Uh, I think for us over time, it has been uh, very much about building the quality of our work before we, uh, even personally for me, like I had videos that I've been doing for a couple of years before I even said I was a director or anything like that. So it's really about sharpening the blade, getting really good at what you do. And I think that's kind of the bare, that's kind of like the starting point. And then from there is just seeing how it goes. Like for me and Xavier, we often get reached out to. So for both videos, the John Vinyl video and the uh, Uyemi video that are both on MVP, the artist reached out to us. And uh, we, I believe the John Vinyl uh, always was our fourth video with John. But when they reached out for the first time, it was, and you know, they're very transparent, like, hey, we have the, uh, the song, we're looking for a treatment, but there are other directors who are also writing on it. So it's good to know, right? Nothing's guaranteed. So it really came down to the treatment and to the ideas and to how you present it. And then from there, it's just, it, it is really about, I think, I truly believe, you know, people talk about networking being a big aspect of this industry, but I truly believe that the quality of your work outweighs the networking aspect of this whole business because at the end of the day even if you're um even if you can network and have that opportunity to network and be in the room with those people you have to have something to show that matches their level of output you know and that has to do a lot with practicing and all, like me and xavier when we don't do music videos we sh we shoot dance videos we shoot we shot so many random <laughs> dance videos together for, for, for Xavier's class or whatever. So we're always in the mix of exercising our practice and craft. So just to be active, and it's more about like, it is truly the way of life of a filmmaker and you have to love all aspects of it, right? And then the artistry that come and approach you, that's more of a, it's an attribute to your personal journey, but it's never, I don't think people should ever center themselves around other people's work, right? You have to find your own, personality and individuality and move from that yeah. uh katie and blood do you do you when you're looking for collaborators to bring into the project obviously your art is very very um sort of important to you and and uh, but what, what do you look for in in when you're when you're thinking we need to sort of broaden our team uh what what is it that sort of compels you to do that or and then uh, beyond that like what how do you reach out to the people that you want to involve yeah, I would say exactly what Ellen was saying was you look at the work. Um, when I heard about Mashi, it was my A&R had just seen her work and thought it was really cool and that it would work well with my music and my sort of aesthetic that I'm trying to put out. And that was what leads it. There was no sort of networking besides that. And then I sent her an email and that's where our relationship picked up. So I think like that's absolutely, I'm sure people get, connected in many other ways, especially in Canada, it's smaller than we think, but um, it's absolutely just the work and making sure that the visuals add up with the soundscape of an artist. And one thing I wanna say about networking in general that I've found is that everyone responds to fandom or to mutual respect. Uh, and, and I think that you, this doesn't work for every cold email you send, of course, you're gonna send eight or 10 emails before you get a response uh, from one. But I think that in general, if you approach somebody saying, I loved your work in, in this, I love that particular music video. I think it kind of works with what I'm doing. We should get together and talk about whether there's a connection here. I think it's uh, the problem often with networking is you go, here's all my like accolades. Here's why, why you should work with me. 
but it really should be the other way around where it, where it's sort of saying, here's why I want to work with you. Here's why I think that what you're doing is special and, and that our arts will interact uh, with each other well. Um, and, and I think that that works when approaching from the filmmaker side or the recording artist side, when you're approaching an MVP grant, like shoot your shot, find, find that director you like and say, hey, do you think we could team up? They may say no, they may not say anything at all, but they, they also might say yes. And in Canada, you know, it's likely that they, they will welcome a connection like that or like someone reaching out like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also want to add really quick note to that because I think it's actually has been really useful to my journey is like uh, not a lot of artists, like you don't have to make a video with them right away. There are other, way that are other ways that are more instant and more uh, like doing quick uh, photo session, right? Something like that is way more low stakes, way more chill and casual. And it's a good opportunity to exchange the creative time and show your work collaboration with them on like a lower scale without jumping into the video. But it's a good mm -hmm. intro and opening into that relationship. Oh, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I want to end on one last question because it's kind of broad and I think that everyone will have a different answer to this, but uh, the best piece of advice for those who want to apply the MVP project, I think that it can be sort of uh, in general uh, about grant applications, but but uh, specifically like what's something that, that you would say to an applicant that's sitting down to start their application? Start early and and get your i get get the idea and collaborators kind of down for the idea early on so that any hurdles you run into for the actual application process um you can answer them because you know the idea so succinctly that you can kind of easily answer any questions that come up to add to what uh, blood was saying i think another thing to do is especially when working with the financials um have a lot of room for contingency uh, because when you're stretching these budgets, there's kind of a minimal margin for error and anything that goes wrong could be catastrophic. So make sure that when you're working with the financials, not to overlook the possibility for certain mistakes and anticipate that there's going to need to be contingencies and backup plans, especially if you have complex technical elements. And, and also to add to what Xavier's saying, like, I feel like oftentimes, uh, newer filmmakers when making budgets, it's like things like food, gas, transportation, like really small things like water for the crew. You know, when you're over budget by $5, $50 craft is now it's 50 bucks out of your pocket, right? <laughs> so it's like, you really want to make sure that you're not losing money making something. But at the same time, uh, we always find ourselves like we invest into our work. So it's not like you're spending your money, but you invest your money into the piece to make it better. Because ultimately that's, I mean, we're all building ourselves up as artists right now. So we're very much in that building investment phase. I think that never really ends. Yeah. Katie, do you have a last word to leave us on from the recording artist standpoint? I would say dream big. You I, go. you know, I get a lot of people around, you know, there's directors, producers, managers, that are allowed to sort of reel it in so you got to have big ideas and you know do the grant is a cherry on top so you might as well come up with the craziest ideas you can think of and biggest ideas that you want to have actualized and then let other people reel you in but start with a big idea and your biggest best idea you can and then hope that it happens eventually so i think dream big is a really great uh note to end on uh i want to remind everyone that that mvp is open now until the end of the month so uh you know start sending those cold emails to the filmmakers you love and uh hopefully we get a bunch of good applications from those uh in in attendance today uh, also please feel free to reach out to me neil at mvpproject.ca uh, or submissions at mvpproject.ca if you have questions because uh we're happy to help you now navigate. Um, I want to just say a big thank you uh, to Alan, Bled, Katie, and Xavier for joining us today. I, I really enjoyed talking to you all. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.